Some lines about uh, Jose Miguel. Jose Miguel started uh, his career in California in the University of San Diego. Uh, later he was working at ESO and, and in 1989 uh, she incorporated at the ISC as an astronomer, uh, as staff astronomer of the ISC. Uh, for many of you, is a well-known personality since he managed with the uh, Grand Tecan Telescope. He was the responsible for uh, from 1995 till 2009. And um, according to her main field of interest, well, we met together because we both love uh, AGNs. And, and so we have served some time working on ADNs and we have some uh, students and postdocs in common and, and we have been organizing the three years uh, Spanish ADNs uh, meeting. Um, but now, as you can see, and this is the topic that he's going to, to present today, uh, now he moved to the very far universe um, um, yes, uh, and today he will talk about uh, the universe at relative 6.5 whatever it is so Jose Miguel it's your turn thank you thank you thank you Beba. and let me tell you a few things about the epoch of realization, which is around six. And I try to show that realization was achieved mostly by low luminosity galaxies. And often, and very often, these sources would be close together, forming protoclusters. And at the end, I will show you how one of these protoclusters produces a an ionized bubble, which is spinning photons to ionize the medium. So when people have tried to, to do luminosity functions <coughs> at high redshift, they, they see that it becomes very steep at low luminosity. And this is the reason why people think that low luminosity sources that is very difficult, uh, they are very difficult to see because they are very faint, but those are the, the ones that power the, the realization. Yeah, last. Yeah, I know the this is much better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a few years ago we started what we call the Alba project and the name Alba was because it was we were trying to detect the, the first sources in the universe but that's a, another story that I can tell you later if you want essentially what we did was, was to select a field, a cosmological field which is the the surrounding field. And we found two sources that were very close together, very strong star forming sources. And we decided to, uh, to study that field. What we did at the beginning is to perform deep imaging with three filters, three of the shadow filters. This one tuned to, to a ratio of 6.6. Because the, the two sources that we discovered were at, at the ratio of 6.5. And then we had one to the blue and one to the red. And the idea would be to detect sources in the middle filter, probably with some continuum on the red filter and nothing at all with the blue filter. Because they are supposed, the, the sources that we were looking for were either Lyman alpha emitters or Lyman ray galaxies and they shouldn't have any, any flags in the room. 
So we found 45 fan sources, and then we decided to do spectroscopy. So we applied for most multiology spectroscopy with Osiris, with the 25 high grade uh, infrared rating, and the observation was, was done in 2016 and 2017. We have 40 hours, 32 that we uh, requested at the AIC and 8 from the University of Florida. And the idea was to, to select some of the sources that we have discovered with the imaging to perform spectroscopy. Essentially, we were able to, to put 16 sources in the mass, then six stars for centering and, and three figures. And on top of that, there was one of the Uchi sources that we also inserted in the mask just for calibration and, and to, to see whether we were doing the right thing or not. So the data reduction became very difficult and we decided to review the data independently at the University of Florida and at the IEC. And we used a combination of visual inspection and an algorithm that is called noise chisel that I tell you in a minute, to, to see the sources. Essentially, this, this algorithm, what it does is, after we mask the skyline, then it looks for contiguous pixels that do not look like, like uh, cosmic rays or defects in the uh, array. And so it, it gives a, a number and it rates the, the sources, but that serves as a guide to, for us to look into the images, the spectral images, and decide which are true sources or not. And so that's the, these are the spectra that we obtain. These are what we call type A because they are good spectra. You see that they are not near skylines. This, this, this is the sky spectrum, actually reduced because the, those lines are amazing. This line, if, if you would plot them, are much larger than they escape from the, from the, the screen. So they are scaled down. But Anyway, these are the main regions in all the system, and these are the sources that we detected in one, that one. That one, this we call pile B because probably the winds are affected by, by the sky, and we have some, some other sources that we call B because this one has a line here. This probably is in the field of that. This is in the field of this one. Um, so we are not very sure. So, so we have to understand these are slitless, or, uh, slits, and then, uh, short slits. So why do you see sky residuals all along? What do you mean? The sky, the, the mission line, the seed was for the sky. In the 2D? In the 2D space? In the 2D, yes. Because the, the reduction was very difficult and there is always residuals. But you should see the residuals all along. Yeah, but there are these holes that they shouldn't be here. You see, this is an over, an over subtraction. And it's very difficult. I mean, this data is, is a nightmare to do the, the, the data reduction. And finally, the, the type C, they are, we, are we, we think that this is a source, but it is within skylines, like, like this one. The, the nice thing is that uh, when we were working on this, Ibushi published that they are doing a, a survey, 
very large surveys in the world they feed. And they publish, well, they haven't published yet the paper, but they produce uh, a, a preprint which we got, and they have some sources that coincide with the sources that we have the spectra. They used much better resolution and they were able to, to discern much better than we the skylines. And so probably those are also true, but we are not considering them. So in total, we consider that 10 sources ha have been properly detected, type A and type B, out of the 16 that we have in the max. This is probably some of the faintest sources that we have, that people have done with the, with the GDC. Some CETA spectra possibly are okay, but we are not considering them. And with, we think that these are the lower luminosity sources that I mentioned before are responsible for, for the real assessment of the universe. Now, this is a coded spectrum. Oops. This spectrum has been known with the 10 uh, spectra that, that we think we have detected. And we can use this to, to check the quality of the spectra that we, we got. Essentially what we've done is we average the, the type A and B sources and this average gives us a flux or a luminosity in this case because we multiply by this <coughs> which is this. And the luminosity measure in this is very similar as you can see. So probably we are not putting some or, or at least a lot of sky into the wings of our light. So the work done so far has been uh, detailed in the first paper which dealt with the photometry in 2017. There is another paper that has recently been submitted with the spectroscopy. There is a third paper which is now in press with the evolution of the protocluster. And I think I, I gave a seminar here about the, this protocluster in 2017. And there is also a, a fourth paper which shows the, what I'm going to tell you today. So, from the, from the spectroscopy, what we have was Neumann alpha fluxes and luminosities and redshifts, essentially. However, the Neumann alpha line is a resonant line which is difficult to deal with because it's scattered back and forth in neutral hydrogen, if there is the least amount of dust it gets absorbed, then it can be also, uh, and, and at the end, if there is no dust or whatever, at the end it appears very far from where it was produced. Then there are also problems due to the geometry of the gas, and if there are outflows, there are also additional problems. So all of this, normally what people do is we encapsulate all these problems into what is called the escape fraction of Laman alpha photons. So in that, in that concept, we think we encapsulate all of these problems. And so how do you do we divide the lambda alpha scale fraction? There was a nice paper, not very long ago, that it was calibrated empirically from observation of, of many galaxies. And this is what they got. <coughs> the, the, 
the scale fraction on lemma alpha photon is proportional to the equivalent width at rest in, in, in the sources. However, that's not the only way of determining it. And in fact, it's not the way we use it because we have, we didn't know the equivalent width of the sources because the continuum, we didn't have a continuum. So what we did is we modeled the lambda alpha scale fraction. And the reason for, for the modeling is because there is a close relation between the production of lambda alpha photons and the amount of neutral gas in the halos of these galaxies. And, and the scale fraction can be written this way, where d alpha is the optical depth of lambda alpha to that to line and alpha photons. So since we didn't have equivalent width, we used this model to, to determine the line and the line alpha k fraction. Um, the model can be seen in this paper by Inoue and Higuchi and the detail of the calculation is in this paper. And so these are the these are the, the scale fractions that we measure for the sources. Here this. These are the ten sources that we detected, type A and B, and this is the Ouchi source. And you can see the average one of a scale fraction is probably two. And there was a paper by Martin Hayes. In 2011, and, you, and that he produced a curve for the lambda alpha scale fraction of different sources at different, at different ratios. And you can see at, at, at 6.5, this is probably between 2 and 3, point 0.2 and point 0.3. So we are more or less there. And so that allows us to measure star formation and the intrinsic star formation, which is the star formation um, corrected by all those problems that I was doing before, which essentially is dividing the star formation by the line of scale fraction. And the star formation that we get range from 0.9 to 4.7 with an average of 2.31. So you can see that these are starburst regions, starburst galaxies, but very, very low luminosity. And indeed, the average continuum luminosity of these sources is minus 19, which is also very, very low. So summarizing, these are the kind of sources that likely reorganize the universe. They are low luminosity and starburst. So let me now go to, to ionized bubbles. Essentially, this is a sketch that you probably have seen many times of how realization proceeds. This is the surface of the scattering. This is what you see when, when you look at the cosmic microwave background. And eventually, there were stars that started to, to leave and to start ionizing the, the medium. These sources <coughs> produced probably very small bubbles. Then there were galaxies that also form around this time and produce larger bubbles. These bubbles probably collided together and at, at the end, by around the six, by around the ratio of six, the universe became really ionized. So, Let me now go back to the protocluster that we discovered 
those 45 sources that I mentioned before that, that were coming from the imaging uh, and the 10 sources that we, for, for which we have spectra, those form a protocluster whose evolution has been studied. And at the end, this, this cluster is going to become much larger than coma at CTC. But the other aspect of the cluster is that you can measure the X-ray luminosity, assuming that these are star traverse regions, star -traverse galaxies, using a web tool that was prepared by Oki Flores and Mass Physics. We can get the, the X-ray luminosity from the Lyman alpha flux. Inputting the Lyman alpha luminosity, we get the X-ray luminosity. And then the mechanical energy, uh, assuming that 5% of this mechanical energy is converted into X-rays, we get the mechanical energy. And if you compare this with MT2, which has the mechanical energy of 10 to the 4, 40 years per second, this is two orders of magnitude larger than this. So the energy input of these galaxies in that form a protocluster is about two orders of magnitude larger than the energy output of energy. So we think that this lies are sending huge quantities of mechanical energy, sufficient to, to pierce holes into the intergalactic medium and, at the same token, to produce, to let uh, ionizing photon to escape to the, to the intergalactic medium. But let, let me mention a few concepts that I'm going to use in what follows. Of course, you all know what is the observed gamma alpha luminosity. It's, this is the luminosity in the gamma alpha light that we observe. But the intrinsic gamma alpha luminosity is calculated from the observed gamma alpha luminosity by dividing it by the gamma alpha scale fraction. Okay? And this would be the Lyman alpha luminosity emitted originally before any absorption, before any scattering effect, before any of those problems that I was mentioning before. And then there is something that we call the effective number of ionizing continuum photons per cell. And this is the rate of ionizing continuum photons that correspond to the intrinsic lambda alpha luminosity in a typical H2 medium. So from, from the intrinsic lambda alpha luminosity, we can determine the ionizing continuum photon per second. Okay? And then there is the intrinsic number of ionizing photon, photon per second, which is the rate of ionizing continuum photon emitted by the massive stars in the galaxy before, again, any absorption or scattering. And this is derived from the effective number of ionizing continuum photon by the value by this quantity. Where the other continuum is another top. So, this is in summary what I was telling you. The luminosity, intrinsic luminosity, alpha luminosity is sustained by dividing by the scale fraction of lambda alpha. And from there, we can determine the number of ionizing photons per second with this expression that we can see in this paper. Of course, we are assuming that galaxies are behaving as true stars, but that probably is what it is. And so, this is the intrinsic lambda alpha luminosity, and this is the number of continuum, lambda continuum photons. That's what we determine. And this number here 
is not directly the sum, but it's the sum corrected by a completeness quantity. The reason is that we detected 10 sources out of the 16 that were in the mask. If we were capable of inputting the 45 galaxies that we discovered in the image, in the mask, we will have determined, we will have observed if the ratio would be the same, something like 28 sources or 29. <coughs> And so we need to multiply by a factor 2.8 the 10 sources, and then we added the, the first source, that is one of the other two sources. Okay? And now the, the, the state formation of Lamont continuum photo. This is something very difficult to determine directly because it's very difficult to determine, to observe the far UV continuum in, in this type of sources, very far away. <coughs> and so people assume that this Lyman alpha, Lyman continuum scale fraction is similar to the Lyman alpha scale fraction. And normally people assume that it's between point 0.1 and point. I have to say that recently people are assuming that this scale fraction of random continuum photon is much, much lower than this, is of the order of 0 0.5, 0 0.05. But I will, I'm going to assume that this is, these are typical values, and that is what I'm going to do. So, the line here, in the sum of the ten sources and the and this last one is the sum of these sources multiplied by a correction factor and then with the two with the two which sources add to add. <coughs> and now this is a a, a, a figure from the paper by figure sign. 12, that tells you what is the number of ions, uh, continuum photons per second and per volume, per unit of volume, they are per second. And so uh, this depends on the, this is a, these are, these are lines that tell you a different ratio how much the scale fraction is. This C is the clamping factor of the neutral gas, and it's assumed to be three. Before, it was assumed to be much larger, but recent models have come down to uh, around three at 6.5 and two at eight, at eight. And so, these arrows here that are we have put them in, in the figure. And if you follow the C6.5 region, you get that for a ratio, point, for, a, for a scale fraction of 0.1, you will get uh, this number of photon per second per, per unit volume. This for 0 0.15, 0 0.2, and 0.3. So these are the numbers that we have in units of photons, continuum photons per second and per volume. Okay? So finally we have calculated the number density of ionizing photons from these sources and we obtain more than sufficient ionizing photons the bubble containing the protoclusters. But not only that, there are enough photons to enlarge the bubble up to a volume of this size and, and radius of 
which is corresponding to a radius of about 18 cubic megaparsecs. And this is an example of the bubble that, that through percolation, achieved the full ionization of the universe. And that's all. This interesting talk. Um, we have time for question. In the spectra of the ten sources that you mentioned, um, do you detect any other emission line apart from wine and alpha? No. For one, we had a very narrow narrow region because we we were detecting sources only in the region that was coincident with the width of the filter the center filter and we didn't see any continuum at all no other line Presumably, these are very low metallicity galaxies. So my question is, all these uh, computational X-rays and mechanical energy from OT Florian uh, at Alan, uh, is that for pure hydrogen uh, nebulae or for low metallicity? So do you take that into account? Yeah, but I guess you can assume just uh, 10 to the minus whatever, the lowest metallicity models that they have. The tool that we have used is the one that Miguel Mas and his students produced long ago, and these are for normal starburst galaxies. And for possibly the metallicity, the metallicity in those normal starburst galaxies is larger than this. But yeah, so I, I don't know whether the comparison is really fair or, or not because of that. But, uh, anyway, but, but my second question is, I don't understand the scale fraction of Lyman alpha and the continuum because for an opacity for the Lyman continuum of one, an optical depth of one, the optical depth in Lyman alpha, this is for a pure hydrogen nebula, is 10 to the 4. So I don't know why in the literature it's considered that the scale fraction are of other similar for the continuum and uh, Lyman alpha. What, what, what do you mean? That we are assuming very large values of Lyman alpha scale fraction? Very high values of continuum, Lyman continuum scale fraction, because it should be of order of 10 to the 4 minus 4 that for Lyman alpha. There is a more recent paper by Finkelstein in where he assumes that the, the scale fraction of Lyman continuum photon is 0.05, 5%. But these are values that people are using normally. I mean, 0.1 is, is a typical value that people have assumed, and even 0.3. If you, if you determine if you use this this formula here you observe with good good continuum Normally, you, got, you have typically equivalent width of 180, 100, and this gives you a scale fraction that are 40, 50 percent. Uh, on that, because uh, we use the fuse data, with fuse data, we observe RO11, 
and the value we obtained for, from the continuum, from the Lyman continuum, was about 2.1. So that is, is completely consistent what we have been uh, applying in the local universe. So that's yeah. uh, thank you, Jose Miguel. Uh, I have a question. Yes, the, the values that have been produced is out of the order from 0 0.05 to some of them claim they are 0.15 or something like that, which direct measurements from very, you know, from ultra trabile spectra. But uh, I have a question about the, the number of galaxies and the, complete, the, the completeness factor. Uh, you assume this is a cluster because of the number of galaxies and the proximity and, and then, did you actually produce the luminosity function of the cluster and correct, and then so, so you integrate over the whole mass uh, of the cluster to produce the global number of the ionizing photons? Or just, just... But we did have, we did produce a luminosity function, yes. And actually we used the luminosity function to study the evolution of the, of the protocluster. Yeah, because that was the idea. Because Actually, sampling in a precise moment because of the redshift, but uh, I presume there are other members of the cluster were lighting more or less when, during, when the cluster were produced, not just 10 or, or, or 16. The cluster has 45 sources, which is what we observe in the imaging. We, we actually determined that there was a very light core at, at that age that consisted of three or four galaxies. I don't remember exactly, but no more than that. And the rest eventually would, would, would collapse and, and form a cluster that would evolve mm, like normal cluster. I that in terms of the, the global That would be larger. The, the, oval, the overall budget would be even larger than your numbers, isn't it? I mean, if the luminosity function is so steep, how can you integrate? You don't know. <laughs> so, so that the total budget is going to be, well, I don't know. <laughs> So Miguel, I'm, I'm curious, but I don't want to put you in a compromise. Uh, you mentioned off the record that uh, you had some radio data. Are those related with new radio data with this project? No? Ah, okay. More questions, comments? I just, uh, I am out of the galaxy thing, but I was very curious about what you mentioned. The ALBA project was looking for the first sources. There is an idea that we st I am still pursuing that. Essentially, in the, in the ALBA team, there are two people who w work in Barcelona who are theoreticians. Eduardo Salvador and Alberto Manrique. And this wrote a paper uh, selling, saying that reinitiation proceeded in two steps. A first step produced by population three stars that achieved practically total reinitiation, and then these stars would decay, and it was the galaxies that produced the final realization. And the first realization is a C10, a redshift of 10. And the idea that we have is to launch a satellite, a small satellite, to, to observe with a filter at, at a redshift of C10 for this type of uh, sources. But that is coming and going. <laughs> Do you have any 
observation for this galaxies. The submillimeter, but there are some of, in this field, in the Subaru D field, there are with ALMA, and I think people have detected one or two of the brighter sources, but not these <coughs> low luminosity sources. Or comments? If not, thank you, Jose Miguel, for the talk. <laughs>